Hello and welcome to the Booker Price podcast with me, Joe Hamia. And me, James Walton. And today we've got our book of the month, which is Washington Black by Essie Adujan, shortlisted in 2018 when the winner was Milkman by Anna Burns. Why don't you tell us a bit about uh, Essie Adujan? Yeah, I mean, she's got really impressive kind of list of achievements, uh, tallying even behind being chair of the Book of Judges this year. So she wrote her debut novel, The Second Life of Samuel Tyne, at 24 years old. Um, and it was shortlisted for the Hurston Wright Legacy Award in 2005. And then a Booker nerds, as you say, will also know her by her second novel, Half Blood Blues, uh, which is about a mixed race jazz musician, Hieronymus Falk, uh, who is abducted by Nazis in Berlin at one point in the novel. Um, so that was shortlisted for the 2011 Man Booker Prize, as it was then. I believe it also won the Scotiabank Giller Prize. She's a big Canadian award. She's Canadian, isn't she? Yes, she is Canadian. And then her third novel, Washington Black, which is what we're going to be discussing today, was also shortlisted for Booker in 2018, as you say, and also won the Giller Prize. She also features in, this is another great Booker connection, Margaret Busby's 2019 anthology, Daughters of Africa. Uh, and Margaret Busby judged the prize in 2020, the year that Douglas Stewart won. This is good Booker nerdery. Thank you so much. I actually pulled that off the top of my head. Can you believe it? <laughs> no, no, I can't. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We've been doing this too long already. <laughs> yeah, I know. Maybe we should go out and touch some grass. Anyway, <laughs> James, why don't you give us a summary of the novel? Well, well I'll, just, I'll just tell you also that it's... Um, one of the reasons we're doing it is it's going to be a drama series on Disney Plus later this year. Uh, obviously, it's the book we're interested in today. <laughs> so, uh, okay, let me try and let me let me try and summarise it. It's quite a wild ride, actually. It starts off mm -hmm. as a, a sombre slave narrative. It's set in the Faith Plantation in Barbados in 1830. Washington Black is the name of the main character, known as Wash. He's got a mother figure called a Big Kit, and the book starts with the arrival of Erasmus Wilde as the new um, boss of the plantation, and um, is an incredibly cruel man. And then Big Kit and Wash are invited to the big house to serve a, a meal. Mm -hmm. And after that, Erasmus's brother Christopher, known as Titch, invites Wash to be his assistant who looks after him. Now, Wash is terrified of, of this, you know, just, be, just being alone with a white man, I think. But he gradually comes to realise that Titch is a lot kinder and a lot less racist than his brother. I know that's, that's not a very <laughs> high bar. bar is low. <laughs> the bar is very, very low. Titch is there for two reasons. Um, he's gathering material on the cruelty of slavery for a abolitionist friends in, in the British Parliament. But he's also a man of science, and in particular with an interest at this point in hot air ballooning. Um, and he recruits Wash as his assistant, I think mainly because he's just the right weight for the ballast, in fact. Yes. Uh, but then discovers that he's amazingly talented at drawing and illustrating and, and pretty smart at, at science too. But then something happens, I think we can give it away really, the cousin of Erasmus and Titch who's visiting commits suicide in front of Wash. Yes, his uh, name is Philip. That's right, his name is Philip. And because he's alone with him, he knows, Wash knows that he'll be blamed for this and killed, probably not all that quickly. Um, at which point, Titch says, OK, in that case, we'll escape on the hot air balloon. So they get into the hot air balloon and escape. And at this point, the book becomes kind of wild adventure. Well, yeah, an adventure yarn, a kind of Treasure Islandy boy's adventure thing. It, the, the balloon crashes into a ship, mm -hmm. which is um, captained by a bloke who's got a twin brother who is the surgeon on the ship. But, but you can tell the difference because the surgeon's missing two fingers. Mm -hmm. Uh, they get dropped off in Virginia, where Titch sees a, a poster which announces uh, yeah. that there's a bounty now of $1,000, obviously quite a lot in that time, for the recovery of Washington Black, dead or alive. And then there's another adventure aspect there, which is that the man sent to capture him is a guy called Willard, who's a classic sort of ruthless yes. adventure baddie. And then there's more adventure stuff, because they escape from Virginia on a ship uh, manned by a captain who's got a treasure map he's been given by an old salt, because <laughs> uh, they're on the quest for some barrels of oil that have been left in the Arctic. And they pitch up in the Arctic, partly because Titch's father is an Arctic explorer, what do you mean by a bit wild, who has been rumoured to be dead, but Titch isn't sure and has gone to find his father in the Arctic. And, and then Titch leaves. And then, I don't want to give too much away, but Wash has lots of uh, more adventures in lots more places with Willard hot on his trail. Also a slight Dickensian feel to this, I think, the kind of orphaned boy at the mercy of a cruel adult world. Uh, at one point he even wanders about uh, graves at night in a pit from great expe expectations styly. Uh, he also falls in love, further develops his artistic skills and ends up masterminding the world's first aquarium in London, <laughs> by which point he's still only 18, but still also haunted by memories of Titch and a desire to work out what their relationship meant, both to him and to Titch. And with this comes another switch of tone then, I think, I don't know if you agree, uh, it becomes a, becomes a sort of exploration or meditation even on what freedom actually is, what uh, Essie Adudin herself calls a journey of self-discovery, 
And um, again, a sort of exploration of, of the uneasy, at the very least, relationship between uh, black people and white sort of liberal people in the 19th century and possibly today as well. Mm. It also throws in um, lots of stuff that she's sort of interested in, like she was interested in 19th century science of marine life. In, I have a theory about this, actually. Good, I'm looking forward to your theories. Yeah. I actually think it, it all makes sense. Like I thought about this so much last night. And weirdly enough, the book it reminded me most of, which we've covered on this podcast, was The Amber Spyglass. Because you have this like child protagonist who's growing up and, you know, finds himself in the Arctic one day and in the jungle the next, sort of tethered between life and death, never sure when death is going to come for him, um, you know, with a baddie hot on his trail. Yeah, and, and not the sort of book you imagine that you're going to be in for when it starts, as I say, with, this, with the cruelties of slavery and... 1830 Barbados, or towards the end when it becomes this rather somber meditation on, on, on the nature of freedom and so on. I suppose the question I think I asked you about William Boyd as well, do you think it hangs together? And if so, does it matter? Yeah, I, I actually really think it does hang together. And I don't actually, having thought about it for a while now, I don't think it becomes a meditation on freedom. I think it is from the start. It's just that the it becomes a lot more explicit towards the end because by the end you know, having learnt to read and write and having acquired both legal and, I guess, a personal idea of independence and liberty, uh, Wash is able to express his thoughts. You know, he actually has, I know this is going to be something we're going to talk about later, but just purely in terms of his education and training and the ability he has to voice certain thoughts, it's only explicit at the end because by that point, he's finally attained the ability and I guess also the courage to confront these questions out loud. Yeah, I think, I think that's true. But it, it, not that he necessarily is able to answer them. I think Etty Adusian uh, described the book as, a, uh, described Wash as a boy of sensitivity and intelligence. He is. Seeking his foothold in a world where there can be no real belonging for him. But do you not think that, um, not, not to spoil too many things, but there's a mixed race girl he falls in love with towards the middle. And this is, you know, a large part of his life as a marine biologist and an inventor of the aquarium. <laughs> and a genius illustrator. <laughs> yes. Um, but there's that question that um, this mixed race girl, Tana, keeps asking him, you know, as he's searching for Titch after Titch has gone missing, you know, when, when will you be satisfied? You know, if I show you... Your, the records of your birth. If we find out that Titch can't be found in uh, Liverpool, he can't be found in, in Virginia. He, we've been all over the world looking for him and you're never satisfied. And to me, it feels like, you know, once he finally does find Titch, he kind of realises that, uh, this might sound corny, Tana was his home all along <laughs> and he can stop running. Ooh, that's interesting. The Titch... What uh, Wash relationship is absolutely kind of central to the book. I'm, I'm worthy of a bit more story. But just, yes. just before we move on to that, just Wash on his own. I mean, is he too good to be true? This 18 year old sort of prodigy, and also he's also incredibly virtuous. He, he does say things like, you know, I had long seen science as the great equaliser, no matter one's race or sex or faith. But that's not true either, because basically what we've got is like a a boy who is getting like two kinds of education. It's you know he says. Um, when Titch kind of takes him on as an assistant, part protege, part manservant, that it's actually one of the cruelest things he's experienced because he gets this very cosseted view of the world. And then he has to go work, you know, in the kitchens and the docklands with people spitting on him, hitting him, you know, swearing at him. By this point in the book, he's disfigured by, a, uh, by an explosion caused by, accidentally caused by Titch. Um, so he's it's kind quite of, badly disfigured. Yeah, he's got a very badly burnt face. Yeah. He he's getting on the one hand a kind of formal education, but he's also getting a, I guess like a, an education of the real world and a moral one as well. And so I think sometimes the things he says are maybe naive, but necessarily so because you know that he's about to encounter something in the world that will that will disabuse him of that belief. And there's like a great quote where he says, "Such were the times." I saw myself growing flint-like and bitter and fill with a restlessness beyond all sleep. Out walking one afternoon, I picked up a discarded piece of tin in the street and peering at my reflection there, I saw in my eyes a lightlessness, a methodical will for violence. I knew I must move on or kill or be killed. And so I think he becomes, I get what you mean in terms of, you know, like him as a, you know, as a kind of like child prodigy. That that bit doesn't last so long, though. Is that is that bit just before he 
He sees some jellyfish in the water and he has um No. He has an epiphany. No, that's that's um just as he's sort of um And then he gets back to drawing. This is this is when he's landed um he's just left Nova Scotia because Yeah, he's hanging out among the the Loyalists of Canada, yeah. which is not a group I knew about. The Loyalists were the people who'd fought for the Brits on the, uh, uh, on the, uh, fought with the Brits against the Americans in the War of Independence, and then headed north to Canada. Yeah. So he, he kind of hangs out with them, and he does he does hit a low point at that point, but he 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 bounces back. I mean, somewhat, but I think like there is still like he he's much more prone to sort of irritability. But this is like one of the markers of like discovering one's own freedom bit by bit. You you do get irritable with people. You're allowed to. You won't be hit for it. You won't be punished for it in the way that. Erasmus might have punished him for talking back. But I like I take your point with is he too good to be true in the sense of, you know, you've got this like incredibly uh articulate, brilliant novel told by a boy who is ostensibly illiterate until the age of eleven? Well, Twelve. Possibly longer, yeah. But as I said to you like last night, I think, like for some reason we really like n- we didn't have an issue with it when it came to um v- Vernon and Vernon God Little. Who no. is illiterate up until the age of sixteen? No, no, that, 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 and then it. wrote these like sprawling pieces of epic stream of conscious prose. Yes, in Vernon God Little, we thought, well, no, no bloke of this age and this education would speak like this, would write like this, and then we thought, oh well, that's just the way this book works. That's fine, and it, and for some reason, I'm more reluctant to do that. But I, but I think the reason I'm more reluctant to it in this case is because it's a very different kind of book. Vernon God Little was quite cartoony and quite broad brush, and this I think is a is a much more careful portrait of an actual boy uh, growing up and being 18 and, and but then he, he will say things in his prose like um he lay sidelong on the blanket like a roman senator or um there was a kind of unhappy mirth to his features like someone greeting a long unseen aunt at a funeral <laughs> i mean how how could he have seen these things is the author essentially just speaking slightly on his behalf sort of throughout the book a bit i don't to, no to be honest with you i didn't really take issue with that so much as and it's to a much lesser extent. I wouldn't compare these novels. I think Washington Black is way more accomplished and sensitive and like fun to read and brilliant. No offense to the other one. <laughs> the, the other one being the other one. Uh, the other one being uh, Paul Harding's oh, this other region. This no, other region. No, no, no. The only bit that I took issue with, which happens in the Harding as well, is that you know, fair enough. Like Wash learns, and, and we see him learning quite slowly and painfully how to read how to write. He struggles with it for years. You know, he has that moment of real pride when Tana gives him a note and she says, can't you read it? I can teach you to read. And he goes, you teach me. Um, but the thing I take issue with is that he is without any kind of training or any kind of encounter with like pen and paper or charcoal ever before, suddenly the most talented artist that anyone in this novel has ever seen. And I think I, I kind of like worry that part of the way that Wash is humanised to the reader at the start or like any kind of value that we're supposed to find in him and that other characters are supposed to find in him hinges on a kind of anglophone cultural precept. You know, he draws really well, therefore he must have something in his soul. But then Adusian kind of tackles this head on towards the end of the book because there's a confrontation between Wash and Titch where Wash is asking Titch, you know, did you ever see me as your equal truly? And, um, you know, Titch says, you were a rare thing. And Wash says, thing? Person, a rare person. Not so rare that I could not be abandoned, not be replaced. I felt a pain high up in my throat. And when I spoke, there was a pressure in my voice I could not control. And so you took in a young black boy and you educated him as if he were an English boy. For his benefit, though? Or so that you might write about it, and I that I think his his kind of being like a uh, an artistic prodigy is is an example of the book maybe slightly falling into that trap. And even the the level of his perceptiveness there. Oh no, I think he's earned it by that oh, point. Okay. Well, let, well, let's let's move on to what what he's perceiving there because I think that's all right with you. Which is which is quite, uh, pretty much at the heart of the book is the relationship between Wash and Titch, not just not yeah. just that and. And the question of the white saviour business. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, I believe that when she first wrote the book, she sent it round to friends and and uh, early readers, and they said, look, this is, this is a bit white ta- saviour, you know. <laughs> and I think, I think in the final book, 
you can see her sort of wrestling with that question. I think not always satisfactory. I don't, I don't know where you stand on this. I mean, because basically it's stuck with the fact that in some way Titch did save him most literally from death and gave him a new life. So there's the one bit where Wash is quite accurately saying, I had never been as equal to him. Perhaps any acceptance of equality was impossible. He saw only those who were there to be saved and those who did the saving. But, I mean, this is controversial stuff, Joe. I know, don't get us cancelled. But, mm. but, but the whole thing. Get you cancelled. <laughs> okay, yeah, 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 that's right. You can get, find some other co host. Um, <laughs> um, but in that time and place, is Titch wrong to think that? I mean, there's two words the white saviour there's white and there's also saviour. So the, the, whole of the, first, the whole of the first section is showing just how powerless um, and how th they are completely deprived of agency, the enslaved people in, in the plantation, of course. Mm -hmm. And then Titch comes along and admittedly, only one guy, but it takes him away in a hot air balloon to a new life uh, from almost certain death. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think that, that I, what I can't quite tell is whether the author is acknowledging the sort of ambiguity of the white saviour stuff or basically tangling herself a bit in knots. I definitely think it's an interesting question. I think there's an argument to be made that uh, in Wash's experience, kindness is relative to a really horrifying existence. So the fact that Titch allows him to eat at the same table, wash, sleep on a mattress with bedding, and, um, and you know, <laughs> look at some books. You know, if you, if you said that just out of context, that would not be a sort of, you know, anyone would go, of course, well, this is basic human decency, isn't it? And I think the fact is that Titch, Titch is an incredibly selfish character for, for all of this novel. I mean, I think his kindness is relative to Erasmus, his brother's cruelty, but then equally, when he's kinder he, than that, but I'll, 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 but I'll certainly take some qualifications. Sure, he's uh, he's much he's much kinder than Erasmus, but then you know, I think he is no, basically he's much just than just kinder than Erasmus. he's he's decent, but next to Erasmus, he looks like a saint, doesn't he? And I think that there's a bit where Tana says quite explicitly, all the while that he was, you know, clothing you, feeding you, etc., he was still using slaves trekking them up and down a mountain with very heavy, you know, instruments and materials to build his so-called cloud cutter slash hot air balloon, treating them no better than, uh, than his brother treated the rest of the plantation. Um, I think that's fair. And then there's that bit where, um, I don't know if this is a spoiler alert or not, but he quite literally leaves Wash in the middle of a storm in the Arctic, uncertain of whether Wash will live or die, even though he insists, I knew my father and his assistant Peter would be there to save you. You know, when Peter and, um, and uh, Titch's father find Wash, they go, well, one more hour and you would have been dead. But Titch doesn't really care about that. I think he is a fundamentally sort of selfish man and that doesn't stop you know, the, his kindness is extended whenever it's in line with his own motives, if that makes no, sense. No, I, I mean, he, I think he is, a, he is an ambiguous character. I'm not, I'm, I'm not, obviously not putting him forward as any. And goes, well, there's a really nice little bit that sums it up, I think. There's one bit where um, Wash is, is um, well, they're both climbing the hill where the hot air balloon is being sort of worked on at this point. And um, Wash falls. And he, <laughs> he is worried. Um, that Titch will think he's broken the equipment. And so he says, nothing is broken, I said anxious, holding up the vasculum that he might see. It is your bones I am more concerned about, Titch crouched beside me, slapping the dust from my shoulders. So, this, so that's a kindly thing to say. And then he says, there are less painful ways to test Newton's second law. So he's making a little joke that he knows Wash can't possibly understand. So there's, there's always a sort of patronising element to his, his kindness. And an, another thing I think is quite crucial that eventually wash spots is that his objection to slavery is really that it's a stain on the white race. Yeah. It's a moral stain on the white race, <laughs> <laughs> which, which well, admittedly it is, but, uh, but you know, actually the, 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 it's the, all the, about me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly <laughs> it's exactly that. It is all about him. But I, I think this, I think this makes Titcher really possibly more interesting character. Oh, they're, they're both pretty interesting. Well, yeah, I mean, he is sort is, of like, yeah. And they're constantly if, changing. Yeah. If we're going to talk about, you know, Washington Black in relation to this other Eden, I think one of the most interesting characters in this other Eden was Matthew Diamond, 
who is also sort of that like white savior uh, archetype who, who actually quite genuinely is racist, like out and out says, yeah. you know, I do feel disgusted by the sight of these, you know, like non-white black indigenous people. That's right, but it's not going to stop me doing my duty. Exactly. And um, I think whilst Titch isn't sort of that, that's interesting, that yeah. bad, it, he's still sort of, you know, inherently, I th what would we call it? I guess with 21st century language, he has his unconscious biases that he can't get rid of. Um, and they yes, are... And, and, and that, but that's slightly different from uh, Matthew Diamond in, in a way, because he has got conscious biases. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> he kind of he knows. I, I, I really don't like black people, but my Christian duty is to help them. Uh, whereas, whereas, um, whereas Titch is like, Titch I'm is God's like, gift to earth, uh, yeah, man. Yeah. Oh, black, uh, yeah. Really helping people. these people. But he does say at one point uh, 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 to Wash, I tried to be kind. I, I, th I, th I think I believe him, but try it possibly tried and failed. Yeah. But did sort of save him in the most literal sense. Well, but this is another, I mean, this is like a huge point of the book is how free are any of these characters? I mean, most particularly characters like Wash or Big Kit, his kind of mother figure, or, um, or Emily, um, you know, essentially um, those who who work on the plantation. But also to some extent, you know, the the brothers and the story or, or John Willard, the, uh, the assassin, how free are any of them? But how free are, in a way, any of us right at the start? Um, uh, Washington says to Big Kit, his mother figure, um, what is it like, Kit? Free. Uh, I felt a shift in the dirt and then she was gathering me in a close, gathering me in close, her hot breath in my ear. Oh, child, it is nothing. It is like nothing in this world. When you are free, you can do anything. You can go wherever it is you're wanting. You wake up anytime you're wanting. When you're free, she whispered, someone asks you a question you ain't got to answer. You ain't got to finish no job you don't want to finish. You just leave it. Now, I think that's not definition of freedom so much as being like really, really rich and possibly, <laughs> and possibly childless. Because, <laughs> because, because on the whole, none of us, I mean, none, none, I certainly you know, can't do any of those things. Mm. I can. <laughs> yeah, 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 you're, you're 20 freelance, 20 somethings. But, uh, but I, you know, I can't, I can't um, you know, finish a job I don't want to finish. I can't go wherever I want. I can't wake up any time I want. Uh, you know, um, well, no, actually, I'm, oh, no, I'm, not, I'm not trying I'm not to be glib. I'm, but... I'm not suggesting that I'm, I'm in the situation of, if I can I make this perfectly clear. <laughs> <laughs> no, James, you have not 18... worked on a plantation. <laughs> <laughs> 18, 18, 18, yeah, my life's just as bad. No, what I mean, no, it's obviously not that. It is the point that um, uh, that we are, that, that, that definition of freedom, I think, is... It, it's a, a very bit, idealistic one, yeah. A bit silly. Yeah. Well, no, I don't think necessarily silly. Um, but I take your point um, in the sense that there's this very interesting, intense scene where Erasmus and Titch hear from their cousin Philip that their father is dead. And, and Philip says, well, you know, Erasmus, your mum wants you back in London to uh, wrap up affairs at home and uh, deal with the household for a bit. And uh, Titch, you're going to have to take over the plantation for two or three years while he's off doing that. And um, Erasmus can't wait to get back to London. Titch has no desire at all to be a slave driver. And there's this kind of standoff where Erasmus can't go to London unless Titch agrees to take over the plantation. Meanwhile, Titch doesn't want to take over the plantation, but can't in all good conscience say no to his mother, who's newly widowed. And there's this kind of standoff of desires and... They're definitely not legal unfreedoms, but you know, as you say, like who who is truly free of any kind of responsibility or uh I'm not gonna use the word master here because it's in bad taste, but you know, whether you're beholden to your family or to the money that you need to make your life work, etc. But that being said, I think what Wash achieves, I think he does achieve an agency of spirit and mind, certainly. Yeah, yeah, but I think, I think, I think by it. the end, he's he's ready to, I mean, talk about this whole white saviour narrative. By the end, I think he's very ready to cast Titch off, you know, once they have their final conversation. Yeah. I, and, yeah, yeah. And, and that winning of, and that winning of as far as he gets, in free, I mean, I don't think the idea is that he's meant to end up, he's cracked it. It's a sort of journey towards greater freedom. And he does have a journey towards greater freedom. He doesn't actually reach there, but then, as I say, in a way, which of which of us ever does? Yeah, uh, but it's not it's not glibly earned that either, is it? It's, no, it's, it's 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 really good. And actually, do you know? In in so far as like Big Kit's statement of you can say no to whatever you want to, I think she's talking in much more granular detail than any of us would ever think to meditate on. As in, 
you know, if I want to sleep in an extra five minutes, I can, or she can't. If I, you know, want to take shade from the sun that's burning my neck while I work for half an hour, I can, she can't, you know. Yeah, okay. Okay, Joe, I don't don't want to drop you in it, but when we were having our preliminary discussion, at one point you suggested that maybe the book was in the end too nice. You look as if you wish I hadn't brought that up. Uh, 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 Is that because you don't think it anymore or because you don't want to think it or you don't want to say it? I'm sort of gradually in the process of changing my mind on that, which is why I'm glowering at you from across the table for bringing it up. Uh, uh, Listeners, it's quite a scary glower. (sighs) Thank you very much. I I practice in the mirror. I don't know. I think it sort of hit me that this might be like a really niche part of our audience, but uh, for anyone who's read their France for non, <laughs> there's this uh, thing he says where a kind of cycle of violence more often than not can only be broken with a uh, well harnessed use of violence. And that's why sometimes uh, physical conflict is a necessity and geopolitical conflict is a necessity. And I had wondered on our phone call whether Wash's liberation and kind of path to freedom is maybe a bit too sort of, not that it doesn't contain its own hardships, but like the one act of violence that he commits, which is uh, he he gets into Uh, a kind of... We we, we probably shouldn't give that away. Okay, we won't spoil it. The one act of violence that he commits... You, he does sort of end up saying, you know, oh, um, I stopped myself from from uh, from going any further with it. You know, I only wounded the the person that I wounded so far because my own kind of moral, spiritual self wouldn't have been able to to keep on existing afterwards. And so, not to say that Wash doesn't endure terrible acts of brutality and cruelty on his person. But the way in which he is liberated is very much through a sort of love, care, attention being given to him by whichever stranger, a willing stranger happens to, happens to pass and, by. And his own brilliance. I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I do find moderately implausible his, his, his invention of the modern aquarium. He works out what, exactly what glass is needed and what metal is needed and how you can keep sea creatures alive rather than they... Yeah, I mean, in all fairness, he, he is never properly credited for that. Um, but I, I guess I guess what I'm sort of taking for a walk in my head. I'm really fond of this phrase oh, yeah, since you gave it to me. Right. Taking um, a thought for a walk mm-hmm. yeah. um, is is whether it's uh, not necessarily well, maybe realistic that this boy should have managed to attain the level of autonomy, bodily and and uh, intellectual autonomy that he does by the end of the novel with absolutely zero blood on his hands. And part of me thinks that I'm being jaded or else I have a kind of incorrect impulse on that. And then the other part of me, the part of me that reads Frantz Fanon, (laughs) kind of thinks, well, I think maybe it is a bit willfully idealistic to say that yeah, he just sort of bumbles around from place to place depending on the kindness of strangers as a disfigured black boy in the 19th century without ever needing to like actually like physically defend himself except for that one time yeah, on the street. And there's one time where a friend does it on his behalf as well, I suppose. Mm. Just for people who don't know who Frantz Fanon is, can I, <laughs> can I try and say who he is? Yeah, go tell, on. Me how, tell me how vastly wrong this is. Uh, Martinique born French francophone writer who um, is actually astonishingly influential now because yeah. he, his whole he is the sort of architect of sort of decolonization and colonization along right? with Glisson, I would say yeah. Edouard Glisson. But well, actually, you've, what you've just said then makes me want to ask one last question, which is yeah. maybe too massive for this stage. <laughs> you said in a book that's in a, a book that's realistic. Is it in the end? Is this a, a book that's meant to be a, a work of realism or of slight sort of mythology? Yeah, I could never quite work that out. See, this is I'm thinking this too because my earlier comparison to the amber spyglass suggests that it's like utterly fantastical. But it is. But I know a, that but um, it is partly fantastical, isn't it? Well, I know that Essiodijan's uh, initial inspiration for this was the uh, Tichborne claimant, which in the end, actually, this year Zadie Smith has written about in the fraud. Funnily enough, maybe these are like good companion novels to have uh, side by side if you want a bit of historical 
a bit of historical fiction to tee you up. Uh, that allows me to get something off my chest, which yeah, you might find on. deeply tedious. The fact that he's called Titch, because, <laughs> because he's small, is, I think, one of the books, not, the books, there are some anachronisms in it. Titch, meaning small, came from Little Titch, who was a musical performer in the 1880s. And he was called Little Titch because he looked like the Titchborn claimant. So that, that's where it's from. So the, to, to, to call someone Titch for being small in the 1830s, <laughs> Gross anachronism, Joe. I can see you share my outrage with that. Uh, yeah. Oh, and on that fascinating note, uh, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think it uh, invalidates the book, obviously. But uh, I think I, I think it's, uh, I wish some editor might have spotted that. But anyway, <laughs> that's, by, that's by the by. Um, I mean, I is this serpent's tail? Mm. Get it together, serpent's, yeah, get it tail. Together, serpent's tail. <laughs> so, James, who would you recommend Washington Black to? Well, as you know, Joe, I always find this question quite a hard one because on the whole if you like a book you recommend it to everyone and if you don't yeah, you, you, do. you, yeah. you don't recommend it to anyone uh so on those grounds i'd um <laughs> I, I, it is a it is a a, a a romping well it's 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 a strange book it's, it's a romping read on the one hand it's slave narrative on the other it's how many hands are we allowed it's traditionally only two isn't it so let me let me let me <laughs> so let me um, uh, drop the whole hands business uh but it's also uh, but it also has I mean, a lot of interesting things to say about racial issues then and definitely now, and mm. there and that, that's all intended. So, if you don't, oh, I don't know. If you like a good book, read it. If, if you don't mind a sort of mishmash of a style, you know, if you want an absolutely straightforward, coherent own narrative, then you probably should steer clear. But but then who who does really? <clears throat> this is just the book that it is, and it's great. Yeah. Oh, it's pretty good. No, this is the book that it is, and it's very good. Yeah. So is, this is maybe a slightly lazy or obvious comparison, but like, if you like your Toni Morrison, probably like this. Yeah. Um, actually, I think people who enjoyed um, George Saunders's Lincoln and the Bardo might enjoy this because it is that kind of take, you know, you take something slightly based in fact and you make it a bit weird. You know, Saunders has his ghosts and Edusian has her cloud cutters and Arctic explorers. Uh, okay, let me try and take Let me be a bit less negative about the whole record. Who would you recommend it to? And say that, um, oddly enough, if you enjoyed Any Human Heart by William uh, Boyd, which is basically the author throwing in lots of things they're interested in. I uh, still uh, think that, that, like, the marine biology makes sense because he's looking at animals and, they, like, he's caging or, like, trapping these these octop octopi, octopodes, who knows, octopodes. What's the plural? Octopi, is it? I'm uh, no, sure the, someone's the, going to tell me no, that's wrong. No, because in the book it suggests Tana. I thought it was always thought it was octopi. She tells him off because she says it's octopedes and you're confusing your Greek and your Latin. But anyway. Anyway, that he's sort of um, trapping all these marine creatures to show them off in an aquarium in London and then, you know, one of their <laughs> octopi <laughs> start dying. I don't know. I, I think there's a lot of stuff that maybe on on first read i found a, a bit random but it it does there is a thread yes, no, that the, connects no, that's, all there of it is a, there's a certain freedom thing certainly, yeah no, i never thought of that joe that's true about the aquarium um I if it fits the arctic bit but, but oh god yeah. i mean i think we're out of time on this podcast so we can't do a whole digression on the arctic but yes warmly recommend it all <laughs> it's a, it's a, yeah it's a, it's a good old read yeah so that's it for this week. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok and Substack at The Book of Prizes and join our book group on Facebook. Till next time. Bye. Bye. The Book of Prize podcast is hosted by me, Joe Hamier, and by James Walton. It is produced and edited by Kevin Moyolo and the executive producer is John Davenport. It is a daddy's super yacht production for The Book of Prizes. 